Amen. Chapter 18, book of Jeremiah. Let me get this thing turned back on again. All right, Jeremiah chapter number 18. Good be in God's house with God's people. Amen. I like that. I thank the Lord when I got saved, I fell in love with church. Church is kind of like my wife. Fell in love with it and never fell out. Amen. Good being God's house. I want to preach a message this morning. I'm going to take it out of the book of Jeremiah. I'm going to make a quick application here. Uh, get Jeremiah chapter 18 is noted for the potter's house. And it's talking to the nation of Israel. If you look in verse number 6, O house of Israel. So we're going to make an interpretation to it. I want to read just a little bit. The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house. There I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house and behold he wrought a work on the wheels. The vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at what instant I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. Now therefore go to speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. Boy, what a blessing it was uh, that he said, if you'll just go repent. Israel became marred in the eyes of the people. Jeremiah prophesied in the reign of Josiah. That was some 50 years before the Babylonian captivity in uh, eight, uh, 587 B.C. So God's giving warning to the nation of Israel. Revival had permeated the land under Josiah. Well, they saw great revival across the land. Josiah was one of the godly kings of Israel. God moved across that nation, but you know it didn't take long after revival that the people began to return to their old ways. You know, the Bible uses a verse that says, Revive us in the midst of the years. Over in Psalms 85, verse number 6, said, Wilt thou not revive us again that thy people may rejoice in thee? With revival comes great rejoicing, but lack of revival may take, makes a lack of rejoicing. So what happened in the years of Josiah? They had great revival, but that's 50 years prior to them going into uh, captivity. Now when they went into captivity, Israel had totally apostatized. 50 years. You look the last 50 years in our nation. And I'm not going to deal with that right now, but we find that God told them, now if you'll go back, if you'll do that which is right, I'm going to benefit you. I'm, I'm going to bless you. The potter is a type of the Lord. They desired to mold the nation of Israel into the greatest nation on the face of the earth. We find that the marring was the fault not of the potter, but of the clay itself. The clay had an impurity in it. And listen, the impurity had to come out before the potter could make the vessel. I've watched a potter work on a wheel. How many have ever done that? You've watched? But hey, that's a very interesting thing. What they do, they take the clay and they put it on a wheel. And they've got foot pedals where they can pedal and it turns that wheel. 
And what that potter will do, he puts that large lump of clay on that wheel. Then he dips his hands into water. And then as that turns, he takes those wet hands so that the clay won't stick to his hands and crumble. And he begins to mold. And he keeps wetting those hands and molding that into the shape that he wants it to be. I tell people it takes God, it takes motion, it takes the water of the Word of God, and it takes a willing piece of clay, and God can do anything with it. So what they do, they make that, but sometimes there's an impurity in the clay. If you get a rock or something in that, then it, it'll just tear it up. It won't mold right. So what you have to do is take the clay off, take the, the impurity off, re work that clay again and start all over. So we find that the potter's a type of the Lord, the marring was the people, and by the way, it brought a subsequently it brought a seventy year captivity in Babylon. Then a remaking he didn't make it away. Now, I want to look at verse number twelve. He told them, if you'll do this, look at verse number uh, ten, he said, I said it would benefit them. He told them to turn from their evil ways, make their doings good. And they said, now they're going to answer God. You would think they would accept the blessing of God, wouldn't you? Look what they said in verse. They said, there's no hope. I want to preach this morning on America with no hope. Just for a few minutes. It was up to the people of God that they could turn that nation. God told them, you can, I'll bless you for. They did not have to go into captivity in Babylon. But notice in verse 12, But we will walk after our own devices, and we will everyone do the imagination of his evil heart. And God took Israel down. Israel's hopelessness, they gave up. Israel's sinfulness, they gave over to sin, and their judgment, they paid a price. Now, what I want to do this morning is I want to make some application to America. As Israel belonged to the Lord, America was once His. Go back to our founding fathers, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time in that, but tomorrow our nation from the Declaration of Independence to this day will be 240 Six years. Now, when they started America, they called it the Great Experiment. Anybody ever read on that? Re America was the first republic ever recorded in history. First one. Never had been a republic before America. So what they did, they called America the Great Experiment. Could the people of a nation rule that nation in godliness and blessing and keep that thing going on. Now, we understand where America's come in 246 years. But it's a great experiment. The question asked, can the people rule themselves? America was the first republic. What is a republic? It's a state in which supreme power is held by the people and they are elected representatives and which has an elected or nominated president rather than a monarch a government in which supreme power resides in the body of citizens entitled to vote and is exercised by elected officers and representatives responsible to the people and governing according to law we sing a lot of times the national anthem. We, we talk about liberty in law. So what is a republic? A republic is where the people hold the power. Then the people send representatives to a national uh, government and then they are accountable to the people that have elected them. I tell people if, if you are a representative of Lawrence County, then you need to represent what Lawrence County represents. But we live in times where the government has taken the power away from the people. And by the way, you hear a lot today about democracy. It, when's the last time you've heard anybody use the word republic? 
What they're trying to do is turn our nation from a republic into a democracy. What's a democracy? A democracy is characterized by mob rule. Whoever has the most votes, it doesn't matter what the, uh, the lesser people or the minorities think. It doesn't matter that we're going to rule according to vote. That's where our America is a heading today, toward a democracy. You don't want a democracy. A republic protects the rights of the small people. If this nation ever becomes a democracy, then there's no use for South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, Montana, these states out there to ever vote for anything because they'll have no say-so. That's why they're trying to take away your electoral college. The electoral college protects the votes of all of these small states and gives them a say-so and gives them a right in presidential election. You know where the first primary is held? In the state of New Hampshire. So we find that America was founded as a republic. I thought of it this way. Has the great experiment failed? I believe that answer is still up for grabs. And I'm going to deal with that in just a moment. I think it'll only fail when we allow it to fail. If we allow it to fail, it will. Hey, we've, hey, we've watched America in 246 years. Our nation has turned from God to godliness. Ungodliness. Godlessness. They've turned from the God that this nation was founded on. 246 years from self-rule to rule by government. Today the government can tell you to do what you don't want to do. That's not what the government's up there for. I still believe that power needs to go back to the states. Roe versus Wade, I thank God they got rid of that thing. It never should have been there to start with. But now what happens is the power goes back to state. People are rewriting history. They say that the uh, Civil War was fought over slavery and slavery needed to be abolished. It was not fought over slavery. It was fought over states' rights. Anybody ever been to Rose Hill Mansion right up here on 49? You can go up there. That's where the governor of South Carolina was at the beginning uh, of the war. He's got a picture of his son up there. His son's name was States Rights. It's fought over States Rights. That means simply giving the power of nation back to the people where it belonged to start with. That's what a republic... Hey, without, without having that electoral college, the inner cities of America will rule this land. We've got to have it the way it is. It was set up right. Our founding fathers, and I don't want to spend the time, they were geniuses when he wrote, they wrote both the Constitution and your Bill of Rights. They looked down through the annals of time and foresaw the problems that America would have. That's why so many people today, they'll tell you the Constitution says and the Bill of Rights says, but this is what they meant. They're doing the same thing. They're walking back what the founders wrote. These founders said that you had the right to life and to liberty and to the pursuit of happiness. These three things they put in that preamble of that to let you know, hey, you've got the right to life. These children they're killing, friend, they, at conception, they're children, and they have a right to live under law. They've got a right to live. Hey, you've got a right to, the, to live today. They gave us the First Amendment. That covers our speech. That covers a lot of things. They gave us our Second Amendment. Main notedly for the right to bear, keep and to bear arms. Boy, we go through there. They set this thing up right to protect our nation. But we have seen things from self-rule go to rule by government. We've gone from capitalism to socialism. It didn't take me but three weeks to make a socialist out of my capitalistic cat. We had a little half-grown cat came up on the porch. Every rib that poor thing had, mama had turned it loose. It, it had to hunt on its own. It wasn't a good hunter yet. It was starving to death. So I told Barbara, it just come up on meow. I called it 
a squeaky. It didn't me out go meow, meow, just squeak at me. So I told Bob, I felt so sorry for that cat. So we went out and got some cat food, and we'd put a little bowl out and let it eat once a day and then take it away and let it have to hunt for the rest of the day. Then we got to leaving the food out there a little longer than we should have been leaving the food out there. And within three weeks, the cat wouldn't leave the porch. It just lay up there and come nibble two or three little pieces and go lay back down again. So we turned it to socialism. You say, what'd you do the cat? The cat is now a capitalist. I took the food away. I poured the water out of the little thing we had on the porch. It'd come up, meow. I'd walk out and scat it away. Listen, you, you don't have time to come up here and beg. You've got to work if you're going to eat. By the way, that is a biblical principle. Over in 2 Thessalonians, the Bible says if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. So what happened was our nation has gone from capitalism. And by the way, when they started in the original colonies, if you didn't work, you didn't eat. We've gone from capitalism to socialism to where people can sit at home and not work and be fed and taken care of. We've gone from rule by the people and for the people to the corruption in the government in which we have today. Listen, our nation in Washington is corrupt. I've often said the difference between Democrat and Republican is just a little space. They both move to the left. They keep enough space to be conservative and to be uh, uh, liberal, but they're too liberal for this preacher. Amen. Neither party can represent my beliefs in whole. Now, I'm going to vote for the lesser of the two evils, and listen, you better do your job. But at the same time, our nation has gone to corruption in government We've gone from prosperity to debt. Did you know this last year was the first time our nation borrowed more money than the GNP? That's your gross national product. That is what this nation in its entirety can produce. We borrowed more money than we came in. Listen, if you make thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars a year, but you borrow a hundred thousand dollars a year, you're going bankrupt. America cannot survive financially and one day soon you mark her down, we are going to collapse financially. You can't just print money and put it up. I'm talking about where America's gone to. They've gone from the thrill of liberty to the drudgery of bondage. People today, they're in bondage to the nation. They're in bondage to the government. Listen, they have enslaved the people little by little. I am not a man that enslaves easily. But I'm talking about where we've watched this. We've watched the pursuit of happiness, the pit of despair. Because friend, let me tell you, the end of sin is always hurt. It's always shame. It's always destruction when you get there. Now, the question is this morning, that I'm going to deal with shortly, is there hope from America? Listen, America's hope lies in its people. I hear people say, well, I'm just one. America is made up of ones. How important is one? I'll tell you how important one is. If there had only been one man or one woman on the face of the earth and they sinned, Christ would have come and died for that one. The importance of one. I believe our nation this morning is important. But friend, if God's people ever give up, that's what they did in verse number 12. He said, I'll bless you. I can help you. It's not going to be easy, but if you'll do what I tell you to do, you'll benefit from it. And they just simply looked back and they said to God, there is no hope. Never give up on your nation. You hear what I said? Don't you give up on America. I'm not going to give up on America. I'll fight for it. I don't care if people like what I say or dislike what I say. 
I'm an American by birth, and friend, I'm an American by choice this morning. I know of no other nation on the face of this earth that I would live in other than Israel if I couldn't live here. I want to say this morning, God bless America. But America has to bless God. God can't bless a nation that will not bless Him. So we come to a little dilemma. Over in Psalms 33, he said, "This blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom He hath chosen for His own inheritance. I thought about America. America's motto, In God We Trust. You'll find something different on your coins if you will look very closely at them. A few years ago, they had the face of the presidents and everything on these coins. And on the left side of that coin, it says, In God we trust. And the faces pointed and looked toward In God we trust. If you look on your new coins, that face is facing away from In God we trust. Don't say that was an accident. They changed the direction of the face because they've been trying to do away for some years now with in God we trust. One nation under God, indivisible. Hey, they're trying to take God out of America. Our motto is in God we trust. America's foundation, religious liberty. Why did people come to the United States of America? They didn't just come for wealth. They had to chisel out a life in a wilderness. A lot of your first explorers in America starved. If it had not been for the Indians, they would have starved to death. Cades Cove up here in Tennessee, the only way those settlers uh, survived that first winter was because the Cherokee Indians fed them. Hey, I'm talking about America. It was started because of religious liberty. They couldn't be free of the Church of England. They couldn't be free of Roman Catholicism in Europe. They were being punished everywhere they went. Listen, Protestants hated Anabaptists. Your forefathers. Why? Because they were Biblicists. Anabaptists were not Baptist people. They were called Anabaptists or rebaptizers by the Roman Catholic Church. But they believed in salvation by grace through faith alone, mixed with no works. They rebaptized as according to the Catholic Church. When somebody got saved, they came out of the Catholic Church, they said they rebaptized. No, they just baptized them. But I'm talking about where we've come from. They came over here because they were being put to death even by Protestants. You look into the history of such men as John Knox and others, they did not like these people and they gave their consent unto their death at times and they came because of religious liberty. Our founding fathers, they were praying men. They spent hours on their knees. They prayed. You, do you know that before they signed the Declaration of Independence, they took three days of fasting and prayer before God before they ever signed that thing. Three days fast. When's the last time you fasted three days and prayed? These signers of that declaration were praying men. Boy, you go back. There's a place called wallbuilders.com. You can look that up. It takes you back to your founding fathers and what they believed. History's being uh, rewritten. Now they say they weren't Christians. They were deists. A deist recognizes that God created the heavens and the earth, but a deist says that God just sat back and watched you like a bunch of rats in a maze and let you just do your thing and does not involve himself in the affairs of men. These men were not deist. America's faith was in God, not Allah or Jehovah or, or Buddha or anything else. Hey, listen. You say, well, we've got to respect other religions. God doesn't. Christianity should never have tolerance for a false religion. We have no room for tolerance. God has no tolerance for false re religion. He said that salvation comes through the finished work of Christ and Christ alone. And if, hey, everything else, he, I've 
read that in Sunday school this morning. They were not to follow after the gods of the land. They were to be distinct in what they believed. I believe that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation. It is a finished work. Death, burial, and resurrection. You can't add anything to that. You can't take anything away from that or you destroy the grace of God. It's Jesus Christ. America's strength was in God's people in local churches. Now we find there's another pronouncement. Over in Psalm 9, 17, he said, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all nations that forget God. As Israel, will we give up this morning? A lot of people today preach and live in hopelessness. I thank God my hope's in Him. America is still worth fighting for, by the way. As Israel, will God's people live in sinfulness? Eat, drink, and be merry. Boy, the motto for the day, the watchword is, just go out and have a good time tomorrow. People will be getting drunk. They'll be eating, drinking, and have a good time while our nation goes down the tubes. As Israel, will America fall? The obvious answer is, if it doesn't turn, she's going down, folks. Did you know that America is not found, the United States or America is not found in prophecy in this Bible? In the end time, you say, why? If that stock market falls, America will be in chaos. And we're just about there right now. Is there hope? I want to give you just four or five things very quickly and then we'll go eat. I think there's hope for America as long as we've got a promise in the Bible from God. Over in Psalm 33, the Bible said, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom He hath chosen for His own inheritance. If America would repent of their sinfulness, today they're pushing sodomy down your throat right and left. That's the only sin that I've seen that, friend, is being shoved down America's throat. The Bible said, as it was in the days of Lot. You say, well, we've got to be tolerant with that. I love the sinner. I have no tolerance for the sin. There's no room for the sin. It's a sin that's an abomination to God. Does America have hope? There's hope. I put a little disclaimer in here because I'm going to quote President Barack Hussein Obama. I say that because I was not a fan. I think he led this nation in the wrong direction. But I'm going to give a quote. He said this, While we breathe, we will hope. While we breathe, we will hope. I want to say this morning, while we breathe, as long as we've got a promise from God, if America turns from her sinfulness, God will turn from His judgment. America as a nation still has a choice. It's not too late. Why? As long as America remains free, listen, there could be revival across this land, but it's going to take a revival to turn America back to God if they just try to turn over a new leaf. That's what religion does for you. Religion turns over a new leaf, but the first time the winds of evil blow, the leaf flips back the other direction. You ever notice how religious people get, and then they get out of church and they lose their religion? And I got saved. I got something on the inside won't go away. It holds me. It instilled within me. I'm talking about as long as there's a hope. There's hope for America as long as there are people that are saved living in it. How many in here are saved and know it? Listen, there are people across this land. Listen, you're getting some bad news out of the press. They said about 80% of America did not want... Uh, Roe versus Wade overturned. Let me tell you, the majority of America wanted Roe. All you're hearing is what they're feeding to the people. A man said one time, you can control the armies of a nation, but if I control the printed page, I control the nation. People of God, saved people, people that know it. The Lord said over in Matthew, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? He went on a little bit farther. He said, Ye are the light of the world. 
He talked about putting that light under a bushel. We are the salt and light that walks these streets. Thank God we make a difference. When Brother Mike was up in that hospital, we witnessed everybody that came in. I gave them tracts. We gave them a clear presentation of the gospel. We were a witness to them and left one of the young ladies in tears of joy when we came out of that hospital. Listen, everywhere we go, they ought to know us when we walk in. Hey, we pray with those that come in. Hey, I'm talking about we make a difference. There's hope for America as long as we got a promise and we got a people. Then there's hope for America as long as there's a, pray that's, a prayer that's still being prayed. Let me give you a verse of Scripture. We usually, we, we go back to another place. John 5, 1 John chapter 5, and this is the confidence that we have in Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hears whatsoever we ask, we have the confidence, hey, we, we know for sure by confidence that we'll get that desire. Over in Joe, uh, Jeremiah chapter number 33, the Lord said, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. How many this morning prayed for America? How many this morning prayed for our government? You know, the Bible said to pray for those in authority over us. Each morning I pray for our president, vice president, all three branches of government, national, state, local levels. I ask God to get them right, to help them to come to know the Christ that will turn things around if they won't. Listen, I thank God we've still got a vote that we can vote with in November. They're always calling me to poll me. I'll tell them, you, you'll get my opinion when I get to the poll and you'll understand what it is at that time. Amen. Hey, I'm talking about America. God's people ought to be praying for our government this morning. One, it's a command of God. Two, I'd love to see the president get saved. Did you know that Christ died for the President of the United States just like He did for you and I? And He could come to know Christ. And if He did, friend, He'd walk into that with a Bible in His hand and tell Him, we're going to run it by the book. And then they would impeach Him. They would. They'd impeach Him. They've tried to impeach Bible believers everywhere. I'm talking about a prayer. As long as we can pray, friend, and prayer does work, you say, well, I haven't seen it work. You just keep on praying. I've got loved ones that need to get saved or get right with God. I don't give up on them. I call their name out to God every morning. I call their name out to God individually on my family and Barbara's family and here and in Kentucky. I pray for these folks. Why? Because the same God that worked in my heart can do a work in their heart. Don't ever give up praying. Then there is a hope for America as long as there's a power to be tapped, friend. Over in Genesis 18, 14, he said this, is anything too hard for the Lord? I still believe God can make a telephone pole talk in a tree walk. I prayed the other day that God put something in the mailbox before I got downtown to pick the mail up. You say, well, what if it hadn't been mailed? God can get it from Wisconsin to that mailbox Quicker than the UPS ever thought about the United States postal system. Listen, they can't get it across town. We paid, uh, we paid Lawrence Electric bill one time, and two weeks later they threatened to cut our power off, and we had sent that thing by mail across town uh, earlier than it was due. Like they never got that thing there, and I'm not knocking them, but let me tell you something. They can fail you real quick, but God can do anything at any time. Behold, God is mighty and despiseth not any. He's mighty in strength and wisdom. Jeremiah 32 said, O Lord God, behold, Thou hast made the heaven and the earth by Thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for Thee. I agree with Dr. Seitler. He preached a message on can God, and the answer was God still can. Then there's hope for America as long as there's a purpose in our heart. 
Jeremiah 28, so Jeremiah abode in the court of the prison until the day that Jerusalem was taken. And he was there when Jerusalem was taken. One day God will be through with America. But he's not done yet, folks. We still sat here this morning in liberty to worship God after the way of the Bible. We have, hey, this old King James Bible I hold in my hand. I can preach it. I can teach it. I thank God I can still share it. I can still carry the gospel everywhere I go, carry the gospel. Boy, I ran out of tracks again in Walmart the other day. I, I guess I'm going to have to get me a shopping buggy. It's got a, a track thing because I just keep giving them down. And then all of a sudden I look down and I've got one track left. That's when you get into selective evangelism. <laughs> I thank God this morning I've still got purpose of heart. I lost some dear friends in Vietnam. They died for that flag. He died in that uniform for that flag, friend. Hey, I'm talking about we've lost some loved ones. Everybody here knows somebody. I was out knocking on doors in the country one day and was out on A.B. Jacks Road. And if you turn out Holly Grove and turn on A.B. Jacks, you go around a couple of, there's a, Nice home setting up on the hill. I'll never forget that hill. Every time Barbara and I drive past her, I point that house out, knocked on that door, went inside with an older couple one day, and they had a picture of a young man in uniform up on the mantel over the fireplace. It was their only son, and he was killed in Vietnam. I'll never forget the pain that was in that family, but I thank that family for raising a young man who was willing to go and a young man who was willing to die. Listen, as long as I breathe, I have hope for America. I have hope that some of these states now will take that power within their hands and they will do what they needed to have done all the time, not only Roe versus Wade, but friend, they need to stop it on the state levels. I believe America will pay a terrible price for the butchering of these babies that has taken place, especially since 1973 with Roe versus Wade. Somebody said, if you've said anything publicly on there, I've, hey, let me tell you, everybody here knows what I think of Roe versus Wade. But I'm talking about America this morning. Is there hope for America? There's hope until the people of God say there is no hope. The Lord said, if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. He said, then, and only then, then will I hear from heaven, friend. God said that he would heal their land. He'd forgive their sin. Listen, God's still a hearing God this morning. But I believe that the burden of America lies at the feet of the people of God. Because that is the only thing that will turn the wrath of God off of this nation. While we breathe, we've still got hope this morning. Let's stand. We're going to have an invitation. When God's people say there's no hope, then America's done. Everybody said we're not supposed to preach on that today. Let me tell you something. I believe that's what this is all about today. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray.